Today we're going to talk about energy and uh, we're going to talk about energy on a several di several different um, methods. We'll first talk about just, just basic energy, what the word means, and then we're going to talk about how uh, cells and living things utilize energy and how they convert energy from chemical energy. So you see in this picture here an example of how um, you can use water, for example, uh, to turn, uh, say, uh, this wheel here. And then you can use that to produce electricity and that kind of thing uh, using the uh, water moving um, from a stream in this case or a river. So let's talk about how you define energy first of all. Energy can be simply defined as the ability to do work or the capacity to bring about movement against an opposing force. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, hard to um, describe what energy is, but if you think about it as having the ability to do work, I think, or bring about a change against an opposing force, it gives you some examples of ideas of energy. Um, we can also talk about energy as being either potential energy, which is stored energy, or kinetic energy, which is energy in motion. So um, a rubber band, for example, when you stretch it, um, it has potential energy because you could let the rubber band go. Um, and it also, uh, you could talk about kinetic energy as in like a rock moving down a hill. We also have certain laws in uh, talking about energy, related to energy, and they're called the laws of thermodynamics. And, and two of them relate to us in this class quite a bit. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred or transformed. So uh, living organisms don't make energy, uh, they only transfer it or transform it from another source. So for example, plants take uh, sunlight, which is a form of energy, and they take CO2 and they transform the, the light energy into a type of chemical energy. Uh, second law of thermodynamics is, is a little more difficult for people to, to grasp. And the second law is basically uh, that uh, energy, uh, as it's being converted or moved from one source to another, uh, never um, you, you're always losing some of the energy. So you're always losing some of the energy in the form of heat. I also call that entropy. So entropy is a measure of, of, of disorder. So as energy gets moved from one source to another, um, you're losing some of the energy in the form of heat, or the other way you can say it is the entropy of, of the universal reactions is always increasing. So for example, when you buy uh, gas for your car uh, and you buy, you know, let's say you buy $5 worth of gas, well, in reality, your car is only good at about you know, maybe getting 20% of the energy and the gas out of that. So the reality is you're getting like $1, oops, $1 worth of gas uh, from it because the rest of it you lose is heat. And and so that, that happens in living systems also, and it helps explain why our body temperatures are so warm. So as we uh, increase our metabolism, as we burn more calories, uh, as we eat more food and we burn the calories, a great deal of those calories are escaping as heat. So here's another example. In this case, uh, we have a like a, a coal burning uh, engine, like a, like a steam locomotive, uh, like on a train. And so what you see in this picture is uh, we're taking coal, which is an energy rich molecule, and we're burning it. And as we burn it, uh, we're releasing some of the heat. That's what they're showing you here. So some of that heat comes off, and heat you cannot really use as an energy source, but some of the energy in the coal is actually being used to boil this water, and as you boil the water, it creates steam, and the steam pressure then can drive this piston wheel and make your locomotive uh, or whatever move from that. But essentially, the energy in that case is coming from the burning of coal, as you see there. Uh, we can also talk about uh, chemical reactions as either being exergonic or endergonic, and exergonic reactions are energy releasing. So when the reaction happens, oops, when the reaction happens, energy is being released 
from the reaction, so that's energy releasing. In an endergonic reaction, energy is being stored. So when we eat food, for example, and we go to take the food and break it down, as we break down the food, we're using the energy in the food. That's an exergonic reaction as you release the energy. Often those are tied to endergonic reactions, so we might use the energy from an exergonic reaction, we might use some of that energy to push an endergonic reaction and store some of that energy up. But in all those cases, anytime you're transfer or transforming energy from one situation to another, you're always losing some as heat. So as you continue on, you'll lose some of the energy as heat. And that's evident in this picture here, uh, somewhat at least. If you look here, here's a molecule you should be familiar with, glucose. So glucose is uh, a type of monosaccharide, is a blood sugar, for example. And you can take glucose, and by putting the energy into it, if you put energy into it, you can hook a bunch of glucose molecules together and make the carbohydrate polysaccharide called glycogen. So that would be an endergonic reaction. If you were to take glycogen or starch uh, or another energy-rich polysaccharide, you could break that down. And as you break that down, you could get some of the energy out of that, and that would be an exergonic reaction. But once again, if you look at this picture here, going from glucose uh, to glycogen, uh, you might think that you could just keep doing this over and over and over again. But you have to realize that you're always, as you transfer and transform uh, this from one place to another, you're always losing some of the energy as heat because of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, another reaction that's an exergonic, endergonic reaction, we see a lot in biology, is this one here involving ADP and ATP. So ADP is adenosine di, meaning two, diphosphate, and ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So you notice there's three phosphates here versus two on this, and the rest of this is the same. There's a sugar there. Oops, went too far. Um, so as I was saying, there's a, there's a sugar right there, uh, right there. There's a nitrogenous base, and that stays the same in both of these. So there's the adenosine um, and there's uh, the sugar ribose there, but ADP two phosphates versus ATP three phosphates. Now, other than that, they're, they're essentially the same molecule, but to take ADP, you see these negative phosphates on here. And what we're gonna to try to do is hook this third phosphate on, inorganic phosphate, and try to hook that on. And because of all the negative charges here, it's, it's very difficult to get that to bond. So it takes a, a large amount of energy to put into that to get that third one on. So ATP, once you hook that on, is a very energy rich molecule, okay, because of that third phosphate on there. So uh, when we have ATP stored up in our cells and we need energy very quickly, this is often where we get the energy from is ATP because by breaking that third phosphate off, you get a lot of energy out of that and you can use it to move your muscles and things like that. Okay. The next thing we want to talk about is um, how a chemical reaction proceeds in, in terms of the energy going in and out and the effects enzymes have on that. So if you look in this picture here, uh, what we have is uh, we have a, a, an example of going from lactose and breaking the lactose down into glucose and galactose. And you can see that in order to make the reaction happen, uh, in this case they're showing you this person, person pushing a rock up a hill or a boulder or whatever, and you notice that you've got to put a certain amount of energy in, but the overall effect is energy comes out. So going from lactose going this direction, okay, that would be an exergonic reaction, okay? exergonic reaction because overall you're releasing energy. Now, I know that you might be thinking, well, you've got to go up this hill first of all. So some energy has to go in to get it to happen. But overall effect is you get that energy back plus a little bit more. And so that energy is what we call, that, that, that hill there is what we call the activation energy. So that's the amount of energy required in order to make a reaction sort of happen in the first place. So the amount of reaction, activation energy, important word there, 
the amount of energy required to make the reaction happen. So what happens is, in this case, we're breaking this covalent bond right here, and there's a lot of energy stored up in that. But in order to get the energy out the way it's held together, you have to put a little bit of energy in. Okay, so uh, if we look at these two pictures here, uh, this will show you, whoops, uh, this will show you in this case, the same sort of reaction. Uh, but notice in this case, uh, up here we have the rock going up the hill and coming down like that. Okay, so we have that release of energy here. And you notice in this case, the hill's much smaller. Okay, so we, what's happened here is we've lowered the activation energy. We've lowered this part compared to this part. Okay, so the activation energy is lower. You should also note, though, that the amount of energy release stays the same. So if you look at that versus that, that stays about the same. So what happens in this case, the difference between this picture here and this picture here, is we have an enzyme involved. And enzymes are proteins that will speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. Okay, so they don't get used up in the reaction. You notice in this case, here's my protein. In this case, this is the enzyme lactase, which will help you dissolve the sugar lactose. And as I break down the lactose, I break it down into glucose and galactose, you see there. And so the enzyme binds to that and it lowers the activation energy by, by sort of bending and twisting the molecule and it weakens the bond so that you can break that. Okay, so what enzymes do is they lower the activation energy, and then you notice this enzyme, once it does that, it's free to go again. It could do another reaction on another lactose molecule. So this molecule hasn't changed. The only thing that's happened is the enzyme has lowered the size of this hill. This part, once again, the overall net energy release stays the same, okay? Uh, here's a picture showing you a... Um, showing you what an enzyme looks like with its substrate. I'll mention that in a second here, bound into the active site. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about about enzymes is the different parts of an enzyme and, and what they do. So here's my enzyme, and, and I think I showed you this once before at one point, but what happens is enzymes have these very particular shapes to them. So the amino acid sequence folds up, and you get primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. And when you're all done, your enzyme has a very particular shape. And part of the enzyme on its very particular shape has a spot they call the active site. The active site is where the substrate can bind to. So if the substrate binds to the active site, what happens is the reaction proceeds. And whatever that enzyme does is what comes out of it. It's called the product. So the product is what is made. So in this case, we have the sugar sucrose, and it's being broken down into glucose and fructose. Okay, um, not all enzymes break things down. Some enzymes put things together as well, um, and so you can get uh, different enzymes that do different things. But in this particular case, we're taking sucrose and we're breaking it down, and this is our product, glucose and fructose. Okay, so that's what's made out of it binding to the active site. Uh, there are ways that enzymes can be stopped or turned off. Um, and so there are, um, you know, we talked about the substrate binding like you see here. Uh, sometimes the enzyme might not be present. So the enzyme is, um, it's a protein. And because it's a protein, it's coded for by the DNA. And DNA regions can be turned on and turned off to either make a protein or not make a protein. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, there are also uh, inhibitors that can bind to different regions on uh, an enzyme. So in this case here, uh, we have what's called a competitive inhibitor. Okay, so a competitive inhibitor will bind to the active site. And once it does that, the substrate can't bind to it anymore. So that stops a reaction. You can also ha have what they call a non-competitive inhibitor, and that will bind to somewhere other than the active site, uh, like what they often call an allosteric site. And when it binds to it, what happens when it binds to it, it changes the shape, so the substrate no longer fits in there. A um, couple general rules about how enzymes work. Uh, they generally will speed up 
chemical reactions if you heat them up. But if you get too hot, okay, if it gets too hot, proteins will denature. Denature is a term we use uh, when a protein starts to unfold. Uh, so if you heat up proteins too hot, uh, they'll, tar they'll start to unfold, they'll lose their shape, and once they lose their shape, uh, they will no longer function because the active site won't be the same. Uh, it could also be too cold, and uh, if, if it's too cold, what ends up happening is the rate at which um, your substrate binds to your active site on your enzyme slows down. So you have all these molecules floating around here, and if they're not running into each other because you slow down the rate at which the reaction is occurring, they're not going to bump into each other, and you're going to get no reaction or a slowed down reaction from that. Um, the other thing is uh, once your enzymes are saturated, so if you have a certain amount of enzyme, you know, let's say you have let's say you have three molecules of an enzyme, okay and you have 500,000 substrate molecules. So these three are working as fast as they can to change the substrate into the product. Well, if you double up the substrate and you make it a million molecules, for example, uh, it's not going to go any faster because your enzyme's all being used up at that point. Okay. Um, and then if all your enzymes are being used at a particular time, there's still extra substrate around. You could add more enzyme and you could increase the rate of that reaction because then you'll have, instead of saying having three, um, instead of having three, Instead of having three molecules, um, you could say have a hundred molecules. And so instead of being limited, think about it like a factory. And if you only have three people on your assembly line and you add more uh, supplies, you're being slowed down by these three uh, workers. You only have three workers. But if you increase it to a hundred, uh, you have more workers, you can get more product out uh, until the product's all gone. Okay, so that ends our talk on enzymes, and from here we'll move into talking about cellular respiration.